Welcome to the power of storytelling to protect the ocean, a conversation with Shruti Gudur Dev, presented by the New England Aquarium Lecture Series. I'm Suzanne Mattis, VP of Marketing and Communications here at the Aquarium. We are a nonprofit research and conservation organization that has protected and cared for the ocean and marine animals for more than 50 years. We're delighted to be hosting this talk and grateful to the Lowell Institute for their generous support, which allows the aquarium to offer this lecture series free of charge. Our speaker this evening, as I said, Shruti Gurudev, I actually didn't say that the first time, so I'll say it this time, Shruti Gurudev, um, shares our passion for protecting our blue planet and is here to talk about her experiences as a conservationist, storyteller, and aspiring eco-journalist. Shruti grew up in Chicago and has always had an interest in the ocean. As a teen, she visit, visited family in Australia and experienced life underwater for the first time while snorkeling off the Great Barrier Reef. Shruti will talk with us tonight about that life-changing experience and how it inspired the work she does today. Shruti is the founder of the e-magazine, An Hour in the Deep. She's a National Geographic Young Explorer and an avid scuba diver. She has served as an expedition storyteller aboard the exploration vessel EV Nautilus, documenting National Geographic's maritime heritage team's journey in the Hawaiian Islands. She's also a member of the World Ocean Day community, Reserve a Youth Council, and the Out of Eden Walk Project. And when she's not advocating for the ocean or working on her digital magazine, she's putting her BS in finance from the University of Illinois Chicago to good use as a credit analyst for Motorola Solutions. It is my honor to welcome our presenter tonight, Shruti Gurudev. Hello everyone, it is an absolute honor to be here and speak with you all today and thank you so much for coming. Um, I'll be talking about the power of storytelling to protect the ocean, especially from a youth focused lens. Here's my first slide. <laughs> Um, I wanted to begin with a quote by Australian author Tim Winton. Let's face it, you do nine months as a freediver in your mother's womb, you belong to a planet that's mostly water, your body is mostly water. I don't think there's any mystery why we would be drawn to it. I think there's some kind of ancestral yearning. We all came from water. It feels like home. So my story begins in the briny waters of the Great Barrier Reef off the coast of Cairns, Queensland, Australia. I was preparing for a dive and, and getting really excited to see what I thought were going to be these beautiful iridescent coral reefs with fish darting in and out of the reef structures. But as I descended down below um, into the coral reef was entirely bone white. It was completely bleached. And to me, it looked like some kind of ecological graveyard. Um, this was the first time that I'd ever really confronted climate change face to face. Um, but I didn't know what I was looking at. I didn't have uh, the terms to describe this phenomenon. Um, but unbeknownst to me, I had actually visited Australia during one of its worst mass bleaching events of 2015, which is why I was seeing all these bleached corals. And though I didn't have the words to describe what sort of the significance of coral bleaching was, intuitively, I just knew something felt really, really wrong. So for those uh, in the audience who might not be as familiar with coral bleaching, it's essentially when the zooxanthella, which are um, an algae that have a symbiotic relationship with the coral, uh, they expel themselves from the coral due to heat stress from the warming oceans. And so, you know, it, the corals can succumb to starvation and disease and all sorts of negative things, as you can see from sort of the third um, graphic on this slide. After this experience, I remember feeling very dismayed and almost helpless. Um, I didn't know what I could do to mitigate climate change. Um, I wasn't a scientist. I wasn't a marine biologist. And sort of the thought of doing the hard sciences again just terrified me. So I decided what I needed to do was to find my niche, as in leverage the interests that I already have, which were reading and writing, to find a way to make a difference for the ocean. I knew I was a storyteller, and I knew that this was the route that I was going to take to make a difference for the ocean. And this is when my brainchild <laughs> was born for an hour in the deep uh, e-magazine. And um, 
starting this e-magazine off was kind of like a series of shots in the dark, right? I was emailing a bunch of marine biologists out of the blue and begging them to tell me about their work so I could have some kind of content for the e-magazine. Um, and to my surprise, all, all of them were willing to help. But I still had one problem. And my problem was that I didn't have a solid foundation for this magazine at all. Um, I didn't have like a network. Nobody knew I was come. I was just trying to build up this e-magazine. Essentially, I was this random kid living in downtown Chicago with a day job in finance who wanted to start an e-magazine out of nowhere. So things did change in 2020 uh, when a mentor nominated me for a National Geographic Young Explorers Award. National Geographic Young uh, nominates a couple people um, each year, a couple young people, uh, for grant funding in certain Nat Geo focus areas. And mine was oceans. And so when the iconic yellow borders finally accepted me, I knew that this e-magazine really had a chance, like it really had a shot. So I was going to have a, a clear foundation, uh, a new network, um, funding, and so I was getting ready and, and getting excited to begin. Uh, and here's a, a graphic from the virtual field trip I did in 2021 uh, with Brian Scarry, um, who is a board member of this aquarium and an absolutely brilliant photographer, and uh, Salome Bugla, who is an ecologist. And uh, next, we'll move on to a quick video uh, that Nat Geo took of me for Earth Day, which I will play now. In Australia, diving beneath the Great Barrier Reef, I saw a lot of coral bleaching. All of the corals had turned this bright white color. I spent an hour down there and it had changed my worldview completely. So I decided to create an e-magazine, a bridge between art and science. The contributors are between 16 and 26. Hey Allison, how are you? Young people are really a force to be reckoned with. Anyone can be a conservationist. You just have to find your niche. It's never too early to start helping the ocean. I'm Sruti Gurdev, I'm 22, and I'm a National Geographic Young Explorer. So now that I had become a Nat Geo Young Explorer, um, I still kind of, so this was sort of the beginning of uh, the e-magazine. And I had to rely on the power of the network. Now the power of the network has two spokes. One is collaboration and the other is accountability. So we'll begin with collaboration. Um, it wasn't like a host of new people were all like lining up to contribute to the magazine yet. So I needed to rely on the people that I already knew and the friends that I had already made from the youth conservation organizations that I was a part of, uh, namely the Reserva Youth Land Trust. And so those, those friends from Reserva were the earliest contributors to this e-magazine. Then through then through word of mouth and through social media, um, word kind of grew and pe more people started le learning about the e-magazine. So friends were telling other friends and other friends were telling other friends. And then obviously through social media, when you take a, a photo and post it to your Instagram story, other people will find out about it. And then it just kind of creates a network of, of people. And uh, something I'm really proud to uh, tell you guys is that the contributors that have met through this e-magazine are actually visiting each other in their um, like home countries and doing ocean related projects together. And that was exactly what I had wanted. I wanted this e-magazine to be a hub for youth uh, to get together and work on um, oceans and, and tell their stories. Um, the other power of the network, um, which I'm gonna talk about is accountability. So it's easy to find inspiration for like, you know, 10 minutes on like a Tuesday night and you're, you're feeling really pumped and you're like, I'm going to protect the ocean, I'm going to save the world and whatnot. But how do we make sure that sense of, um, you know, inspiration and motivation is sustainable? How do we make sure that um, continues and, and keeps motivating you? Because, you know, real life catches up. The next day we're thinking about, we have to go to work, we have to go to school, we have to think about our family. How do we make sure a goal like, protecting the ocean stays kind of in the forefront of our mind and we're consistently working on it. And that for me was accountability. 
because I was relying on my network. I was relying on the friends that I had made through this e-magazine and the contributors um, because I was responsible for a publication. I was responsible for the work um, of other young people and I was responsible for a grant. And so this kind of kept me going even through sort of hard days, busy days, and um, I felt accountable and I felt responsible and, and that really kind of impacted the motivation to protect the ocean. And uh, leaning on friends and the network uh, was extremely helpful. And then another component of this e-magazine is youth, uh, as you guys saw from that video earlier. And I always say that ignoring youth really means missing out on a critical piece of the puzzle. Um, because I surely I wasn't the only young person who had experienced climate change through, via coral bleaching. Um, surely other young people around the world were seeing the same things, experiencing uh, similar things in their, in their home countries. So where were their stories? Uh, where were their perspectives? Um, and when I read more into ocean conservation, a lot of what I was reading came from authority figures, came from scientists, came from people that were mid-career. But I think it's also really important to invest in young people, um, especially I can say this as the editor in chief of the magazine because the contributors that I work with on a day to day basis are uh, going into policy making, going to lawmaking, going to science, uh, becoming journalists, and they are truly using, you know, the passion that they're they have for the ocean um, and putting it into their careers and so investing in their voices and creating a platform and amplifying their stories is really important to kind of keep that momentum going. And that's why I, I always say ignoring youth means missing out on a critical piece of the ocean conservation puzzle. You know, one day they will be the people to, you know, create laws and um, make sure that climate change is mitigated. Um, and here's one of my favorite slides. It's a picture of everyone that has contributed thus far and uh, just uh, bright smiling faces of everyone. So I'll... Um, this is a screen grab from uh, Nat Geo's Twitter. Uh, they quoted me saying, anyone can be a conservationist. It's never too early to start helping the ocean. And so what I mean by that is that conservation, especially ocean conservation, is multifaceted. Um, you don't have to just be a part of a couple um, you know, career paths to make a difference. So uh, whatever you're good at, you can apply your skill sets to protect the ocean. So. Um, for example, if you're really great at like uh, working with the community, you could maybe start a campaign. If you're a fantastic artist, you could do a mural uh, in your community. And it's really applying all of your skills and all of your talents in creative ways to make a difference. You know, you don't have to be a marine biologist or an ocean um, oceanographer. Uh, you can be anything and still impact the oceans positively. Uh, so here are a couple great examples of that. Allison Achia is a contributor from Florida, and um, she runs an ecological embroidery shop. And um, as you can see from this incredible embroidery that she's done on upcycled clothing and the other sort of embroidery art that she does, she sells these and 15% of her proceeds go to ocean conservation. So she's using her skills to um, impact the planet. Um, and then next we have Alicia Hayden from the UK. Um, she is a marine artivist, kind of like an activist, but she uses artwork to spread the message of ocean conservation. And um, by this brilliant piece, um, you guys can already tell it's won, it's won like countless awards. And um, this is of a whale and it kind of represents whale song and you can see the whale sort of, you know, transforms into sound waves. And um, this is her way of um, activism. Uh, this next picture is by uh, Kelly Cabal, who lives in um, the beautiful Laguna Beach in Southern California. Uh, her former job was as a uh, tide pool educator, where she talked to people who came to Laguna Beach about the animals that lived in the tide pools. And so by educating the public and educating whoever would come to the beach about these um, tide pool creatures, she was again spreading this message of ocean conservation. And so those are many ways that you can still make a difference, no matter what your background is. And now I'd like to get into some of the writing. Um, this is from contributor Gaziza Kanisova, who is from Kazakhstan, and she currently lives in Italy, and she's talking about the Caspian Sea in her native Kazakhstan. The Caspian Sea is shrinking by seven centimeters per year, and the shallow northern part is currently just four to six meters deep. 
For many years, the North served as a food supply for the coastal community who used to eat the fish of the then rich Caspian Sea. The endangered Caspian seals mate and raise pups on the winter ice of the North Caspian. Yet, both the winter ice and the whole North Caspian are expected to disappear, putting this unique ecosystem under the risk of extinction. The risk is already high due to pollution caused by petroleum production, sewage discharge, overexploitation, and poaching by locals trying to make ends meet. Um, and here are a couple of pictures uh, by Gaziza, and that's a really cute fur seal and some other pictures of the frozen Caspian Sea. And there's Gaziza in, in the corner. <laughs> Next, we have uh, contributor Prashant Mohesh from um, the tiny island nation of Mauritius speaking on the Wakashio oil spill of 2020. I was among the many youth volunteers helping to assemble makeshift floating booms out of sugarcane leaves and other basic materials to contain the spill. Mauritians were working day and night for weeks. There were dolphins, whales, turtles, and fish that washed up dead on the shore. The most sobering moment was when a group of fishermen saw a dying mother dolphin struggling to save her baby. The baby dolphin was rolling over on its side, floating on the surface, but the fishermen couldn't do anything to help save the baby. So as you guys can tell, the contributors to this magazine are writing about what they know. They're writing about what's in their own backyard. What are their local stories? And as you can see, climate change, especially as it affects the ocean, is affecting young people in the farthest flung corners of the planet, in Mauritius and in Kazakhstan. And that's why the e-magazine like serves to kind of um, to, to be a place where these young people can tell their stories. And it's also important for, for us to even look into our own backyard and our own local stories. And if you live nowhere near the ocean, um, that's fine. I didn't live anywhere near the ocean as well in downtown Chicago. The only thing we had was Lake Michigan. Um, and then you can use other means like the internet and, and whatnot to make uh, your mark. Um, so here is arguably my favorite part of this presentation. <laughs> it's really when I get to become an English teacher. <laughs> it's called Elements of Effective Storytelling. So these are elements of, of how um, a, a good journalistic article should be, eco-journalism. So I'll run through A through G. First would be finding interconnectedness. So when we're telling stories, why should we care? As human beings, as readers, why do we care about these distant marine organisms that don't affect us in any way? For example, why do we care about what's under those hydrothermal vents? Why do we care about what's under the ice in Antarctica, right? So finding interconnectedness, connecting our human experience with um, what's going on with the planet is an important way to get readers to care um, about the ocean. Next would be telling a character centric story. Um, a lot of environmental news, a lot of environmental journalism isn't just about the nature, isn't just about the trees and about the water and about this and that. It's also about the human beings. Who are the people who are being affected and, and what's happening on, on the human side? Next would be accessible but compelling language. And this is probably one of the most important parts, I would say, because we're not trying to convince the scientists about climate change and about the ocean, about the importance of that. We're trying to convince everybody else, lay people, maybe your family members, maybe uh, your friends who don't necessarily care about the environment. Um, so using language that is easy to understand, that is clear, that is interesting and compelling, um, and that doesn't use scientific jargon and unnecessarily large words, like we don't want to open up at the source and start picking out big words just to make the article sound good. So it's got to sound um, easy to understand. So that's the way most people will be able to start caring. Um, next would be including concepts of resilience, solutions, and empathy. So. Um, making sure we talk about human resilience, what are solutions that, uh, what are the human ingenuities that we are coming up with to solve uh, these pressing problems? And then last, empathy, again, why should we care? Again, it kind of goes back to interconnectedness. So why should we feel empathy for these distant creatures and for these distant um, parts of nature? Then curiosity, conflict, and hope. That's essentially how to structure your article in general. So first, you got to get people interested, pique their curiosity. Then um, conflict, what's the problem? What, what are we trying to solve? And what's kind of the crux of this article? And lastly, hope. So 
we want to make sure we end on a sense of hope, especially because I think a lot of times environmental news can be pessimistic and depressing, and it can sound like, hey, we've destroyed the environment, it's doomsday, there's nothing we can do. Um, as the editor-in-chief of this magazine, that is not the kind of article that I like to publish, um, because it doesn't help anybody to read depressing news. I'm sure expressing the reality is very important, but ending on a sense of hope, how are we trying to fix this? What are kind of, you know, reality-based optimism that we can sort of bring about in this article? Um, and then call to action, right? What can you do as a reader? Uh, what can we all do? How can we read this article, go home and take action ourselves? And then that's another important part of, of writing. And then lastly, ethos, logos, and pathos. And I'm, I'm really getting out my English teacher clause here. Um, you know, I'm sure you guys would have heard of ethos, logos, and pathos from high school, right? Credibility, logic, and emotions. Um, an environmental article and eco-journalism is not like a scientific paper, right? It has an element of pathos. It has an element of emotion. So again, making people care and making people interesting, interested and persuading them to really take action, um, but also not leaving out the logic and the credibility because we need to state the, the fact. Science is a big part of it. And also credibility. What are the sources you're getting this from? And are they reliable sources? And in the next couple slides, I'll be going over how um, writers for An Hour in the Deep are actually using these elements of effective storytelling in their articles. Um, so here are some nice pictures of a humpback whale by one of our contributors, Frankie Wilton. Um, he's from Hawaii. There's another one with the beautiful mountainous backdrop. So I'll give you guys a second to look at that again, and then I'll move on. <laughs> And, uh, okay, um, I'll read out an excerpt from Frankie Wilton's article. Much like humans, the story of a mother humpback is one of absolute sacrifice. From the time it begins carrying its massive offspring as it crosses the sea, the animal must devote nearly two years of its life to rearing each calf. The migration and nursing can cost a mother nearly half of her total, of her total body weight. This physical burden does little to deter these mothers, as some will rear over a dozen calves throughout their lifetimes. For myself, these pairs are a reminder of the value of selflessness. These creatures will forego their own needs for tremendous periods of time. For the naturalists far from home, the maternal sacrifices of these animals remind me of those who have given so much for me. It is a constant reminder that we need not do things purely for our own benefit that there is a beauty to putting your needs second, if only temporarily, to aid others. So this excerpt of the article shows interconnectedness and a character-centric story. So we feel interconnected to this mother humpback because he, Frankie is kind of relating it to our own experience, perhaps with our own mothers, with the sacrifices that our maternal figures would have made for us. Um, to kind of showing there's a similarity between um, the motherhood of human beings and you know child rearing of human beings to one of um, a humpback whale and obviously humpback whales are charismatic megafauna we love humpback whales <laughs> you know they're amazing but the same aspect of finding interconnectedness can apply to those smaller creatures maybe those less charismatic um, animals that people don't really think about or or care about on a day-to-day -day basis and then character centric story of course he's he's making out um this mother humpback to be like a character uh, someone that we you know care about and then uh moving on to this next article by um italian youth eco journalist vera brocchieri she's written about this young man pictured here named gabriele botta uh, gabriele botta is a phd student in material science and he is also uh, an inventor he created a sustainable surfboard called the sponge board and here is um some collage of pictures of what uh, gabriele does and how he makes his sponge boards Gabriele's choice to pursue a PhD research program in material science led him to a realization. The more he knew about carbon sequestration techniques, the more he was aware of climate change on the environment. This gave him an additional push to make an impact. My project was born when one day in my cubicle where I make my boards, I noticed a sponge that had been soaked in resin and somehow solidified. 
and was floating. At that moment, I had an epiphany and I thought, if I put the sponges together, I can replace the polystyrene that represents the inner core of the surfboard. So this shows the element of curiosity, conflict, and hope, right? So Gabriele is curious about, you know, what he's learning in material science, and he is, it's leading him to a realization about these carbon sequestration techniques. And then the conflict, right? How can he impact the environment? It's, it's kind of giving him stress, right? He's thinking, you know, there's climate change on the environment, and he wants to make an impact. And lastly, hope. Um, he's realized that the that the sponges are solidified and floating, and then he's he's come up with this epiphany. Like, you know, um, when he puts them together, they can represent that inner core. So, um, using curiosity and conflict and hope, uh, Vera Brachier, the uh, the author's article, uh, the article's author, has really shown us um, you know this element. So here's a picture of um, the surfboard, sustainable surfboard. Uh, next, we'll go on to another excerpt. To pursue his project, Gabriele started a tremendous campaign to collect used sponges, which was fun but shocking at the same time. Gabriele laughs as he remembers people bringing wet sponges on the work table with cheese still on them, which was disgusting. The sponge board was tested and was able to surf. Though it was his first trial at upcycling, Gabriele's surfboard can nonetheless serve as a point of reflection on two main topics, methods that will enable recycling and or reusing materials, and the value of conceiving a product that at the end of its life cycle can be repurposed. So we see resilience, solutions, and empathy here, um, because, you know, Gabriele is dealing with wet, disgusting sponges, and he's using resilience to test this sponge board. And, you know, the solution, he's reached it because after his first trial, um, the surfboard, it succeeded, it was able to surf. And then empathy, last, he, he cares about the value of conceiving a product that at the end of its life cycle can be repurposed. So um, that's the end of uh, the two excerpts from Vera Brachieri's article. Uh, next, we'll kind of reach my time aboard the EV Nautilus. So last October, I was given the opportunity uh, to sail aboard the ship exploration vessel Nautilus um, with National Geographic and Ocean Exploration Trust. I was there with my maritime heritage team, part of National Geographic, to do archaeological research and photogrammetry on some of the sunken World War II era aircrafts uh, below the ocean around the Hawaiian Islands. And uh, we spent two just blissful uh, weeks um, aboard the, the ship, and it was amazing. And um, here's just a nice picture <laughs> of me just doing what I like doing best, just floating in the ocean, just doing a bit of a, a free snorkel here. And uh, here's a, a picture of me and Bob Ballard. For those of you who might not know who Bob Ballard is, he is an incredible explorer. He discovered the Titanic and he also discovered hydrothermal vents. And a quick fact about him, he's looking for Amelia Earhart's uh, sunken aircraft that no one has ever found. So I'm wishing him all the luck in doing that. And, you know, he's taken the Nautilus to, uh, to do so. And uh, one of my favorite memories that I have with Bob Ballard that I like to reminisce on is uh, one day after a dive, um, I had come back with my hands cut and bleeding everywhere. Um, it was because during a decompression stop underwater, I was holding onto a rope and that rope had cut my hands and I was bleeding. And so I came back to the ship and I was trying to clean it up and put some band-aids on and, and Bob kind of intercepted and I was a little starstruck at first. And uh, he started bandaging my hands and he gives me one look and he's like I have grandkids and there there was like a current of understanding that just kind of passed between the two of us and I was like thank you Bob I appreciate it and um so that's my fun memory with Bob and um here's a picture of him regaling us um in, in the ship and this is part of our team uh, th there's a lot more of us but this is just <laughs> a group and then here is um, another section of our maritime heritage team. Uh, this is Dr. Jason Raup from East Carolina University, professor, uh, and then Professor Justin Donovan from UCLA, me looking really confused, <laughs> and then uh, Dominic Bush, who is a PhD student. And here we were trying to um, deploy um, a remote operated vehicle. And uh, in this next picture is them actually deploying the ROV uh, from the dive boat. 
And here is um, an image of one of the wrecks, one of the kind of the decrepit hunks of metal that we found down there. And it's obviously the ocean has overtaken how it looks and, you know, it's, it's, it's a sight to behold, really. Um, this is a, a World War II Curtis SB2C1C Helldiver, and uh, this was found in Malaya Bay. And our team came here, and we all scuba dove and, and kind of saw this wreck, and they were doing photogrammetry, which means they were swimming latitudinally and longitudinally um, around this wreck to take a bunch of photo photos. And using those photos, they would put it into this program called um, Agisoft Metashape. And what this program would do is that it would recreate 3D models of what this wreck would have looked like kind of in its full form um, back in the day. Um, and here's another one, a World War II landing vehicle tract. Uh, this was in the waters around Maui. And here's uh, our um, the archaeologist on the team, uh, Professor uh, Justin Donovan and Dr. Jason Raup. Um, and they're taking some photos and doing some archaeological work um, there. And here's 360 video of what, kind of what's around these wrecks. Um, and then here's a nice uh, image of just the ocean and where we were diving. And you know, it's, it's beautiful um, under the waters of Hawaii. Um, and then here is um, a portion of our of the team. This is kind of the combination of OET, the Ocean Exploration Trust, and National Geographic. So it's kind of intermingled. All of us are kind of in this picture, holding up the National Geographic Society flag. Um, and then here is our team. Uh, this is our core team with um, archaeologists, underwater photographers, storytellers, and educators. And um, kind of coming towards the end of the presentation here, um, here are two pictures of you know the editions of the magazine. So uh, this is the cover for edition one. It's um, a kelp forest uh, drawn by the, the young artist um, Anna Sirchula, and then edition two by Glesney Lewis from Wales. And she, this is of a uh, firefly squid. And I work with these artists to come up with the concepts for the covers. And you know, they're just a absolute spectacle, really. Um, and then volume three here, which, as you guys can probably tell, this is um, inspired by Gabriele Bata's story on the sustainable surfboards um, for volume three. And then I've also included my contact, my email and my Instagram accounts in case anybody would like to connect. And if anybody uh, would like to be a part of the e-magazine and contribute um, writing or artwork or photos or film, storytelling is so multifaceted. So no matter what kind of storytelling storyteller you are, you have a place in the magazine. And um, for those that are uh, still watching, thank you so much. And if there's one thing you learned from my talk, it's that anybody can be a conservationist and anyone can care for the ocean and we can all use our skills to really impact the oceans in a, um, you know, a meaningful way. So thank you guys so much for your time and I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Shruti, that was my hands were good. Uh, that was awesome. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> so we're going to spend some time. Um, we've got time for questions with Shruti. So we have, and we have folks at home. So if you see me looking at my phone, I'm not multitasking. I'm I'm taking questions from the virtual audience. Um, so if does anyone here want to start off? If not, I will take a look at my phone as well. Yes. Yep. <laughs> Um, oh yes, of course. Okay, I'm gonna, so I'm going to repeat the question for the folks at home. Um, as editor-in-chief of the magazine, uh, can you talk a little about the impact you have beyond the magazine itself? Do you contribute? Um, well, I think the, the question is you contribute to different foundations. There might maybe, well, I don't know if, you, if there's a monetary aspect of it that would allow you to do that, or um, does that cover it? Okay, <laughs> we can add as we go. 
Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so essentially, so the grant funding that I've received from National Geographic Society, so. So in terms of like uh, donating to charities, uh, that hasn't been a part of our process so far. What we do is that we pay uh, the youth contributors for their work and for their writing and, and for their contributions. And so that's kind of the, the monetary aspect of that. Um, in terms of impact, it's really kind of just building a, a bigger and bigger hub of storytellers. So, um, you know, the magazine, it's, it's essentially just trying to continue edition by edition um, to make sure young people's stories are told but uh, in terms of actually donating, uh, I currently just utilize the funds to make the magazine run and also pay the contributors. So uh, that's how it works. Thank you. Yes. Yes. That's great. The question is, how are you thinking about other media um, or exploring into other platforms? So in terms of other media, we've mainly kept this online uh, because it, it tries to reach uh, such an international audience. And so kind of going on to a website uh, essentially seems to be the easiest. In terms of other media, I think um, Mainly the other thing that I've been trying to incorporate and, and working on for future editions is uh, trying to use GIS, GIS mapping software to kind of help contributors pin where they are and what's happening in the ocean. So we in, we're really just trying to focus on like the, the web and online aspects uh, for the magazine, yes. I, I'm, go for it, yes. So the question is about Shruti's time on the EV Nautilus and how she got involved and how she found the scientific environment, um, given that her background was in business and not in science. Right. So uh, the opportunity with the EV Nautilus came about because National Geographic Society um, formed like a partnership with OET, which is Ocean Exploration Trust. And they wanted to have uh, National Geographic explorers uh, aboard the Nautilus to conduct um, projects, whether they are scientific in nature, or in our case, archeological in nature. And so there were other teams to answer your question that were doing scientific research. You know, there was um, another Nat Geo team with us was doing work on microplastics. So essentially they were throwing buckets um, into, the, into the Hawaiian waters and trying to do research on what microplastics were showing up and, and how far you know these microplastics were, were reaching in the ocean. Um, and also one doing like doing shark research. So that was really cool. Our team focused on maritime archaeology because the professors that um, and the Nat Geo explorers that we were with um, they were archaeologists and um, I was the storyteller aboard. We had an underwater photographer, Dr. Jenny Adler, and then um, we had who's an Nat Geo explorer and we also had um, an educator. And so kind of what we did, uh, Ashley Gwickley is our educator, and what we did during that time was um, we, would, we would do like ship to shores with high school students. So we would kind of um, join live from the ship to connect with high schools around the country, elementary schools as well, and kind of all across the board really to talk. Um, and, and the team was very multidisciplinary. So it didn't necessarily matter that I didn't have that scientific background because my my job on board was to tell the stories, was to kind of collect what um, what everyone was doing and kind of come on those dives as well and then kind of put that together. And I, I've written some blogs for the Nautilus and uh, and essentially that's what we did. We kind of went out um, on certain, on good days to do diving and on these sites um, and we would take pictures and then I would kind of be there and sort of watch the action of what was going on and then, and then write about that. And um, after that, it was just sort of milling about on the ship and uh, sort of helping out other um, teams work and, and whatnot. So yeah, that, that's a, that kind of encompasses what I was doing on the Nautilus. So I'm going to pause here for a second and take a question from the virtual audience because it ties into something that you just talked about. What advice regarding conservation and storytelling for younger students would you have, specifically elementary school aged? 
yeah, I mean, elementary school is a, is a great time to be, you know, filled with passion and inspiration. And I think really just for me, what helped the most was involving myself in a network. And for me, that was youth conservation organizations, youth ocean conservation organizations. Because through those organizations and through those networks, you find opportunities, you, you meet people, and you get to do projects that you wouldn't necessarily kind of be able to do or start completely on your own. And um, for young students there, I think, you know, even joining like a, like a group like the climate teens <laughs> we have here, that would be a very helpful way to start and to just try to learn as much as you can, you know, read the articles, read your books, maybe watch the documentaries and, and soak in all of that science and knowledge and, and, and good stuff. And yeah, that's my, that's my advice. And I just want to acknowledge that the New England Aquarium climate teens are here tonight. So thank you for joining us, Ashley. <laughs> Question. Okay, great question. Um, so as Truth is reaching out through her eco-journalism and who is she talking to? Does she know who she's talking to? Does she, does she have a, audiences she wants specifically to be talking to and does she know if she's reaching them? And from a, are they young people? Um, are there people of color? Who are, who, are you tar who are you trying to really reach and do you feel like you are and do you know if you are? Yeah, Thanks. absolutely. Great question. Uh, thank you so much. So um, the target audience is uh, definitely youth sort of between the ages of 16 and 26. And, and the audience that I'm reaching is mainly kind of young people that are college aged or high school aged. And so and, and slightly beyond that, maybe kind of young working professionals and whatnot. And um, a lot of the contributors so far have been from uh, the US and the UK, but you know, the diversity aspect is really important because um, as I had gone through in the presentation, you know, we had contributors from Mauritius, we had contributors from Kazakhstan, but I definitely do try to get a, a like a global audience as much as I can. Um, in terms of the socioeconomic factor, that I'm still doing some research on because you know it's it's difficult to tell sometimes. So um, really getting a global reach is uh, is a big priority for me and i would like to sort of tackle um more of you know sort of the australian side and maybe um the continent of africa and um sort of just make it a lot more uh global and international and from countries that uh, maybe aren't um as uh, exposed and so we we had someone from bermuda bermuda also contribute so making sure that circle as as international as possible is, is a big uh priority Yes. Hi, it's Renai. Hey, good evening, I should say. Thank you for what you've just done. I brought a group of young people with me. My name is Rina Alga, a teacher in the PCS. And the reason why I brought them is they had as their homework this very topic and things that they can do in their community. He wanted to ask a question. His name is Teddy. Teddy wanted to ask you, uh, what can he do at his Oh, I mean, that's, that sounds wonderful, and I, I would love to. Yes, so uh, as part, oh, I'm so sorry. It's okay, it's okay. I just want to acknowledge that Dina, who is a teacher at BPS, is here with a bunch of her students, and Teddy had a question about how Shruti could be part of their curriculum. Okay, cool. Sorry. 
sorry about that. Don't Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> really got excited there. Um, so yes, actually, so um, as part of the, the work that I did with the Nautilus, um, I was a part of our educator Ashley Glickley's curriculum. Um, and uh, they kind of learned about my work as a storyteller and um, about an hour in the deep. And they're also elementary students. So uh, definitely, you know, um, I'm very happy to get involved uh, with you and, and, and work with you on the curriculum and, and happy to do that. And um, also in Mauritius as well with the Coral Project. Uh, I know I was a part of you know, a brief curriculum there as well. So um, anything I can do to help um, him and, and you know, get involved with him, I'm, I'm happy to, yeah. Of course, <laughs> my pleasure. I'm going to take one from the virtual audience and then we'll come back up to Eric. So I'd like to contribute to the magazine at some point, but I haven't written in a long time and don't know if my writing skills are up to par. As my work is more numbers oriented. Is there anything I can do if I'm not sure about the quality of my writing yet? Um, that's absolutely no problem. Uh, you can definitely reach out to me. And the way our magazine works is that we we don't just kind of leave you alone and you know throw you to the wolves or anything. So for me, there's like uh, there's editors. Um, I'm there, and we kind of work with the contributor and we work with the journalists, and and we kind of go from very very beginning outline stages to the end of uh, and to like a final polished draft that's able to be published so if you haven't written in a while that's not a problem at all like you know obviously we'll still work with you and 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 get that piece out there and, and published and so yeah absolutely that's that should not be a barrier at all and and you know uh, if you're watching this please just email me <laughs> And we'll, I think what we'll do when, we're, when we leave is put the slide back up with your sure. contact information. That so sounds great. Um, anyone who wants to grab it can see it. All right, now to Eric. Um, just that context for my question, I recently did a training that uh, was targeting scientists, but teaching skills in journalism and storytelling. Um, and what was sort of something I didn't know about was the reluctance from scientists to utilize um, emotions or, or pathos um, in the way that they communicate their science because it can sometimes conflict with their credibility or their ethos, as you mentioned, um, in the scientific community, but sometimes it's necessary in order to target audiences beyond the scientific community. So I was wondering if you could just share your process for navigating the difference between credibility in a scientific field and the emotional pull or the interest that really gets your readers interested in learning more. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Man, okay. I'm really not good at waiting my turn. I'm so sorry. <laughs> You're welcome to repeat the question, too, if you would like um, to. You could go ahead okay. and I'll repeat it. It'll get, it didn't work. Um, so the question was about, so Eric recently went through a training, he's a scientist, um, on how to communicate through storytelling. And he was struck by how scientists are often hesitant to bring emotion into their communications and storytelling because it feels like it might sacrifice credibility. And so if Shruti could talk a little about how to balance um, emotion and scientific credibility. OK. Thank you. Yeah, so um, that's a really great question. And I think really with the way we kind of structure these articles, it sort of ta it gives that scientific background first. It explains sort of the ins and outs uh, of the science in an, in an accessible way. But then afterwards, we kind of talk about, we sort of connect it back to sort of the bigger picture. Why is this important? And, and why should people care? And, and bring about the sense of emotion, not necessarily in a, in a very kind of over-emotional way, but in a way that brings about a sense of like optimism and, and hope. And again, you know, it, it really paints, when you paint a picture uh, with words and use that imagery, I think for me, when I read, I feel a sense of emotion. So uh, this is one example of an article I read um, called Deepest Dive Ever Under Antarctica Reveals Shockingly Vibrant World. And this is like a, a published piece, but it kind of reminded me of that. You know, it, it, it had um, the science where it talked about, um, you know, the, the life under Antarctica, the, the sea life that's um, experiencing climate change under Antarctica. But it, it showcased you know, these uh, brilliant pictures. It, it kind of um, had this very beautiful descriptive writing that kind of brought about a sense of emotion because um, the author was showing that even those small creatures under Antarctica were suffering from climate change and were experiencing climate change. 
and kind of connecting that to our human experience was kind of what brought about that sense of, uh, of pathos. So uh, that's what I would say, um, kind of hitting both in, in the article and kind of ending with a sense of hope. Yes. started with a dive, you've taken it pretty far, where, where do you envision that um, you'll be able to get to and what is your big hope for the future for the work that you're doing? Oh, a question about Shruti's grand plan. <laughs> so he started with a dive and it, then it led to an eco journal, um, an eco magazine. And so what is the next, what is, what is sort of your next goal? Is there a big picture vision that you'd be willing to share with us? Yeah, absolutely. Finally glad I waited my turn for that one. <laughs> um, so my, my bigger, my sort of longer term goal is, to re is really about the longevity of the magazine. And so uh, it's not sort of like a, a super grand plan. It's to kind of keep it going for, for years and years. And it, it just really started in 2021. And so making the magazine bigger and the technology that, that we use, again, like adding that mapping software and just uh, making it more accessible to people. And I, I know sort of um, I'd like people to start subscribing to the magazine rather than just checking the website each time an edition pops up. And then uh, just making sure that reach uh, is as wide and as far as possible. And I know I'm going back to an earlier question about diversity. And so getting those youth voices from um, all around the world and for different experiences of the ocean and um, making sure that I'm doing the best job that I can as the editor-in-chief of um, amplifying these youth voices, especially those that may have been overlooked or not heard. And so, and so really, I guess the, my answer in a nutshell is longevity of the magazine and, and, and making that bigger and, and making it easier for people to, to read and more interesting. So, yeah. Yes. Oh, all right. So if you if you could go back to when you were studying in school, um, would you study business again or would you do science now knowing what you know or what from your business preparation education are you using today that you find valuable? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's 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 a great that's a loaded question, <laughs> um, and so I've always kind of wondered that uh, would I go back in time and change it, um, but I think what I can say from business is that it has given me um, those people skills uh, to be able to network with people and to connect with young people from around the world and sort of work with them um, throughout a period of time and kind of you know be able to to take meetings and lead meetings and and sort of I'm used to that from from the business perspective um, and would I go back in time and, and and change that is I think what I would do is add on to it rather than completely change it I would have loved to maybe um, do more of a, have more of a storytelling background maybe do like a minor in journalism or like a double major or something like that um, and uh, even even something scientific so I think adding on to that knowledge of, of finance that I have and, and the knowledge of business uh, would be good all right, we're going to take one more question. Um, yes. Thank you. I'm just curious uh, with all this work you've done, what conservation measures have you seen that have been most helpful? Hmm. All right, with all the conservation work you've done, what measures have you seen that you found to be most helpful? Awesome. So what con the conservation measures that I've seen is really kind of what I've noticed the contributors to the magazine doing. So uh, they are kind of going to each other's uh, native country. So one of the contributors went to do her master's um, in uh, like tropical ecology uh, to like Mauritius, she actually went there and she did some of those projects for her masters with um, another contributor who kind of helped out. So they're actually kind of in the field uh, contribute, contributing to conservation um, and, and, and really kind of 
like boots on the ground. And, and that's what I'm seeing these contributors doing is, is kind of uh, using their experiences in the magazine and, and writing about what they know and then going to sort of implement that um, and further their conservation career. So that's what I'm excited to be seeing and, and hopeful to be seeing. Thank you. And I'm going to end with a thank you from someone um, online who says, thank you, Shruti, for motivating young people that people from any background can be a conservationist, which I think is exactly what you've done. And I just want to thank you on behalf of the New England Aquarium for being here and doing that for us. You talk about amplifying other people's voices. Well, we appreciate you coming here and talking to us. Um, this, again, I want to thank the Lowell Institute, who contrib contributes and makes these lectures possible, so they're free. And Shruti will be around for a little while longer if anyone wants to stop and chat. Thank you to everyone at home. Um, and we hope to see you for our next lecture on June 8th, when we'll have Joe Roman, Dr. Joe Roman, who will be talking about his new book, um, Eat, Poop, Die. And it's, as you might imagine, about marine mammals. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Shruti. Thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute honor. And uh, thank you all so much for coming. Much appreciated. Thank you. <laughs>